Okay, for the first thing I want to do on the slide here is I need to uh, subdivide. Uh, and just by the way, she's going to join us for the uh, for this little section here. So, uh, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> says no. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I need for you guys to calculate for me. Let's do this in degrees. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask us each to do one number here. Okay. So I want you to find me the sign of zero, the sign of 30, the sign of 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210. Does that make sense? So just take your calculator, type in what that is, and I'm going to make a table of values here. So everybody's only done one. So I want the y value based on the angle, and the angle is going to be zero. Oh my goodness, I should flip this around backwards. There, this is the way the table of values works. So what I say, 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210. Everybody have theirs? Go. 30. 60. 0.8660. 90. 120. 150. 150. 180. 210. Okay, and why don't we as a group just do a few more here? Because there's actually a pattern to this that I want to show you. Uh, the next thing, if I'm going in increments of 30s, would be 240. Okay. Uh, 270. Uh, 270, 300. We'll be back to negative 0.866 again. Okay, that's probably enough. Because you guys are probably picking up on a bit of a pattern. And I think I taught all you guys physics, didn't I? At some point, some amount of physics. What I'm going to show you today is what sine and cosine graphs look like as a graph. And so now that we've done this sort of exercise, I'd like to actually graph this. So on this long table of values here, why don't we split this up so that um, like every two is 30. So like that'll be 30, that'll be 60, that'll be 90, 120, 150. You guys get what I'm saying here? 210. Let me split it up a little bit more. 210. That'll be 240. That'll be 270. That'll be 330. That'll be 360. Okay, I'm going to start plotting some of these. And you're going to see there's a bit of a pattern to it. Zero went through zero. Then uh, 30 degrees was a half. 60 degrees was 0.86 or so. So I'll put that right about there. 90 degrees went to 1. <coughs> And then it started coming back down again. So it went up to 1. 120 came back down to 0.866. 150 came back down to 0.5. Uh, 180 came back down to the number 1. And that's about as far as we got when I gave you guys each a number. I'm not going too fast here, am I? Yeah, it's, it's actually symmetrical, only in the negatives now. Because then 210 was negative 0.5, then negative 0.866, then negative 1. Then it goes back to negative 0.866 again, back to negative 0.5, back to 1. And it makes this wave pattern. And you guys should have a little bit of knowledge of this wave pattern, because we talked about it in our physics unit last year at some point. Yeah, it's a sinusoidal wave. Um, EMR waves actually behave in this pattern. There's actually one that goes up and down in this wave pattern. But if you guys remember EMR waves, there's one that goes in the um, like X direction. And there's also one that goes in like the Z direction. Does that make sense? Do you guys recall this? Not that you need to remember this anymore, but like this is one of your waves like this. And then the other one kind of goes like this. Where like this is the up and down direction wave. And then this is your like Z direction wave. So hopefully you guys already kind of have seen a wave before. What I want to do today is show you guys what the graphs of sine, cosine, and tan, as well as the reciprocals, look like. Try to explain where they came from and be able to solve some problems involved, not just solving them algebraically, but also graphically. But this is your basic sine graph going up and down. And it will keep going up and down ad nauseum for <coughs> Let's talk about some theory behind how this works. Okay. When I'm asking you for sine of theta, what I'm really asking you for is a ratio. If I ask you for sine of 30, 
I'm saying, I don't care what size your triangle is. Let's make a triangle be, say, that big. If this is 30 degrees right here, what I'm asking you for is what is the relationship between the opposite and the hypotenuse? And it's always a one to two ratio. It's always half. If I made this triangle be twice as big, I think I did this before with a big group. If I make this triangle twice as big, but see how there's like a 30 degrees in the corner here? The ratio of sides is still the same. Only rather than it being one to two, it might now be two to four. But isn't the ratio of the two sides still the same? So that's what sine is asking. However, we can approach this another way. We don't just have to consider it to be um, opposite over hypotenuse. We can also consider it to be your y value over your radius. If you guys recall, I showed you a modified definition before, where as you're taking this angle and you're making this angle bigger, it's like you're swinging this arm around the circle, around an earth that is not flat, but around. Yeah. And so if you were to consider this coordinate point sitting right here, I'm going to make a triangle out of it. The radius right here would be like the, the hypotenuse side of your triangle, and your y value would be right here. Now, to make things simple, we're often going to work with what's called a unit circle. I, I talked about this briefly with you guys, but I didn't want to overly confuse the grade 11s because they were still learning this for the first time. Well, what makes something a unit circle? A unit circle has a radius of 1, and that's our point. So if we ever work with what's called a unit circle, then if the radius is always 1, then in a way, your sine of theta value is always your y value. And I want you to consider the y value as we start going around the circle. Right here, in like the initial position, how much y value do you have? None, actually. Y value, you have none. Right? Because you're right on the axis. Now let's start rotating. Let's say we go up to here. Your y value is increasing. Let's say I get up to here. Your y value is still increasing. Your y value is still increasing. When is your y value going to be at its peak? Degrees. Yeah. Right here, your y value will be as big as it will ever get in a unit circle. What amount will it be? One. Because the amount of y you have literally is your radius, which is why if I go back right here, sine of 90 is well, again, if sine is supposed to be your y value, now we keep going. Let's make our angles get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, I know the angle is getting bigger, but what happens to your y value now? It's now going to start dropping and getting smaller until eventually your y value gets back to being over here. At 180 degrees, your y value is back to being zero. In a way, your y value went up, 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 reached the most it was going to ever get, and then your y value is going to come back down, 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 down. Down, which is why when you look at this graph right here, the graph is going all the way up and all the way back down. But it's not flat, or it's round. Or our circle. Is this, example here. <laughs> this will make no sense to anybody watching the video. Because now as our angle increases to here, now our angle all the way around is like, say, 200 degrees. Can you guys see why the y value now has to be negative? Because now our y value is getting negative, and our y value is getting increasingly, increasingly negative until at 270, degree, 270 degrees, when your y value is now negative <coughs> 1. Which is why, again, back here, at 270 degrees, you get a y value of negative 1. And then, just like we've been doing all before, then your y value starts coming back towards 0. Again. In a way, I've got a picture here that kind of tries to illustrate how a sine graph kind of shows up here. I don't know if you can kind of get where this works here, but like right here, let's say there's this angle right here. The y value is this high. Then on this angle here, the y value is now this high. On this one right here, there's not really an angle, but the y value is now this high. As we keep going around the circle, the y value drops. And eventually it's the point where the y value is now in the negative sign. And that's what makes this wavy pattern. Now, does this wavy pattern just occur just once, though? It actually goes infinitely. If you were to draw a true sine graph, it literally goes up and down and up and down like this, and it will do this for forever. Use the circle to explain why. Just keep going around the circle. Can this graph be in the negatives? Go backwards around the circle. I mean, in theory, it would be like, think of a tire rotating. If I just had the tire rotate once, 360 degrees, the tire will have gone up to the top, down through the bottom, and then back to start again. But if I just keep rotating it 
rotating and rotating, it's going up and down and up and down and up and down. But I could rotate the tire backwards. So if we now are ready to do this, grab your calculator. And let's actually type sine of x into uh, like an open slot here. Like y equals sine of x. Okay. Now we should make sure we're all being consistent here. So um, why don't we all go with degrees? So I'm in degrees. And then I want to do one more thing now. Uh, if I use a standard window size, this isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. Like, I'll graph it with a standard window size. Uh, you get this, which looks like nothing. Almost. The reason why is we need to change the parameters of our graph. X is taking the place of theta. We should probably go from 0 to 360 degrees at the very least. And then for Y, how tall does this graph ever reach? Yeah, and negative 1 is as low as it gets. So I should go from, say, negative 1 to 1. So if you change the parameters to this, we should now get a nice, like, sine wave, like you've seen before. So. Now, I'm going to get one rotation's worth of 360 degrees. If I were to change my window to go to 1080, you guys remember how many times around a circle a 1080 is? Three. Three. A 1080 is three times around. So if I go to this, now I'm going to get one, two, three, four rotations, right? Up and down and up and down. And you could even work in the negatives. That makes sense? Okay, I want to show you a couple of issues you might come across here. So I'm going to troubleshoot problems. First one here, let's say you were in radians instead of degrees and you graph it. Then you get something that looks a little bit crazy. Here's the reason why. How often does it take for a circle to rotate a full rotation if you're in degrees? 360, sorry, in degrees, 360. But if it's in radians, it only takes 6.28 to rotate, which means that if I'm going between 0 and 1,000, and it only rotates every 6 units or so, it's going to rotate a lot, hence the like up and down craziness here. So if you happen to be in radians, you may want to do this. Go to your window and make it go from 0 to 2 pi, and you can literally type in 2 pi as a value there, your calculator will, if you press enter, make it into 6.28 repeating. But then, if you're now in radians, now it'll make it look normal. And, while I'm showing you this as well, if you were then to take a, a radians number right here, which is the scope is set for radians, but you put it into degrees and then try to graph it, if you ever get a graph that looks like nothing is happening, the reason why is that if this is now back to being in degrees, not radians, I'm only showing you the first six units worth, but like there's supposed to be 360 units worth. So I'm only showing you the first little bit. That's why this graph is really taking its sweet time and growing. Like it will get there, but we've only we're only showing you six degrees worth. So make sure you're clear between radians and degrees, which one you're using. Okay. Um, here's some more pictures, kind of showing the same thing. But do you guys all feel like you kind of get the idea of how the sine graph turns around? The reason why, just to make sure I'm clear is that sine of theta was supposed to be equal opposite over hypotenuse, but your opposite is your y value, your hypotenuse is your radius, and if your radius is 1, because we're going to default this to a unit circle, then literally you can say that y is your sine theta. Whatever your y value is, is what sine of your angle happens to be. So the greatest it will ever get to is 1. The lowest it will ever get to is negative 1. And it'll just keep going up and down forever. Let's try the same thing with cosine again. So let's assign everybody a cosine value to do. So 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210. Let's try cosine. Cosine theta based on theta, let's write that down here. 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210. And go. Sounds familiar? 60? Sounds familiar? <coughs> Same numbers, eh? And this will be negative 0.866 again. Okay, let's start plotting this. So, I guess I should give you a second to write them all out first, because you only ever did one yourself. Hopefully you guys agree. These are the same numbers we just had last time around, wasn't it? But there's actually a bit of a pattern to it. It's starting at 1, 
then it's getting lower and lower and lower. Then it's even going into the negatives. So let's block this thing. Hope that is 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180. 210, 240, 270, 300, 30, 360. Sure. All right, so the way this one worked, if you guys remember, is it actually started at 1. Cosine of theta is 1. Then I believe it went down to a half. No, that's not right. Went down to 0.866 first, then a half. So it started at 1, and then it went down to 0 0.866, then it down went down to a half, then it went down to 0, then it went down to negative a half, I believe. Then it was negative 0 0.866, then it went down to negative 1, and then Luna, you finished the last one, right? It was negative 0.866 is where we finished off with you. Now, I know that I didn't actually have the rest of you guys plot the rest of the values, but do you feel like you can kind of extrapolate and guess what's going to happen next? If you kind of get the pattern here, then this one's going to come back up to negative a half. 270 will come back up to negative 1. 300 will be positive a half. That number there, and then that number there. And if we kept going, it would have the same pattern to it over and over again. The cosine graph is actually very similar to a sine graph. It has that same shape to it. But now we want to try to explain, well, why does cosine have a similar shape and yet different? And the rationale is in, well, this is what sine was all about your opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine, I'm going to make a new slide here. Cosine of theta is normally about your adjacent to your hypotenuse. However, in our triangles on a unit circle, your adjacent is actually your x value. And your hypotenuse is actually your radius. Let's make this a unit circle again. So if it's a unit circle, then it's x divided by 1. Long story short, what I'm telling you is that cosine theta is your x value as you go around a circle. So now let's kind of graph the same sort of thing here, and let's figure out what your x value is as you go around the circle. As we start over here at 0 degrees, what's your x value? 1. Yeah, your y value is 0, but your x value is 1 which explains why this graph right here starts up here at 1. Makes sense. Then, as we get bigger and we go around the circle, let's say we take it to about here. Your x value is decreasing, isn't it? Your y value is increasing, but your x value is decreasing. Eventually, your x value gets even smaller until you get to this point right here at 90 degrees, Yeah, where you have no x value. You have lots of y value. You have no x value, which is why at 90 degrees right here, the value is back down to 0. Well, then you get to start going into quadrant two. And so the numerical value is starting to um, increase again, but the numerical value for x is actually becoming more and more negative. Right? So now your x value is negative something, bigger negative, bigger negative, bigger negative, until you get over here to 180, where your x value is as big as it's ever going to get, negative 1. Which is why, on this graph right here, at 180, the x value gets only as low as negative. And once you kind of figure out this pattern, well, then as the graph starts coming back again around here, now your x values start to become bigger. They're still negative, but they're becoming closer to zero. Here it reaches zero. And then the x values start getting larger and larger and larger again until eventually your x value gets back to one. If you were to compare these two graphs, here is uh, what your cosine graph looked like. Um, maybe you guys shouldn't write this here just so it's not too messy, but... I'm going to superimpose sine on top of it. Sine looked like this. They have the exact same shape. In fact, they are identical to each other, except one of them is slightly behind. I have a silly little analogy I used to try to explain the difference between sine and cosine. Cosine is a graph. Cosine is a sine graph that failed to grade. Cosine is a sine graph that failed to grade. Here's a sine graph point right here. Well, there's that same point. 
It's a little bit further behind. Here is a random point on a sine graph. I can find that same point on the cosine graph if I just slide it backwards. Does that make sense there? So like cosine is like sine. If you just shift it back a little ways, this same point right here can be found right there. This same point right here can be found right there. How far offset is it? If, if failing a grade is kind of the analogy, how many units is one grade? 90. Yeah, can you guys see that? From here to here, I know I didn't draw it fantastically, but it's set offset by 90 units. If you went back by 90 degrees on each one of these things right here, then you'd actually have slid your cosine graph. Your sine graph slides backwards into a cosine graph if you remove 90 degrees from each other. So they're literally identical to each other. It's just one of them starts at zero and goes up and down and up and down. And one of them starts at one and goes down and up and down and up. Um, one of the things, uh, you know what, this is worth it actually. Do you guys have a blank sheet of paper you could snag? I want to make a manipulative with you guys. I found this actually pretty useful. Find like just a blank sheet of paper that you feel like you can use. And, and I want to show you, I, I did this with my group last year. They found it quite useful. So if you have just a blank sheet of paper that you can part with, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do, you guys know hamburger and hot dog folds? Back like in kindergarten? Do a hot dog fold and fold it like uh, a line right down the middle like this. Yeah, it's fine. I don't really care. Like, it's just for your own sake. Okay. And then fold it in half the other way twice. So fold it in half like this. And like this. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to make a little, like, paper manipulative that's about this big. And when you're done folding it, unfold it all. And I'm going to make a grid that looks like this. I'll show you how this is meant to look. This is what you want to have when you're done. You basically have got eight little sections in this. Can you guys see that? I, I folded it so that I've made myself eight little sections. And I put a, a bar right along here and a bar right along here. You might find this useful. Or you might throw it away. I'm now going to graph a sine graph using these quadrants. It's going to look something like this. Just give me a second to do mine first. Your, your sine graph would then look like this. You're going to start in the corner here. At the first edge right here, you're going to reach the peak. Then in the middle, you're coming back down again. Then at the bottom is the lowest you get, and then back up again. You guys can kind of picture this. The very, very beginning is 0 degrees. This is then 90 degrees. This is then 180 degrees, 270, and back around to 360. So this would be what a sine graph looks like if you want to have like a quick manipulative to kind of go along with that sine x. If you want to throw a second one on, Cosine looks like this. Cosine looks like this one. It's like a big U almost. It starts at the top, goes down through that like middle point you have there, down to the bottom, and back up again. And then this one here would be what cosine of theta is. At least for the first little while, you might find this useful just because it can help you keep track of where everything is. Do you guys understand what I'm going for is that everything above the line is a positive value. Everything below the line is a negative value. And each one of these quadrants right here is quadrant 1, quadrant 2, quadrant 3, quadrant 4. I want to use this to now help show you how to help explain something that we've been working on recently here. I'm kind of going off my notes here. Let's say that I asked you to tell me where sine of theta equals 1 half. We've learned how to do this in our previous lesson with the uh, grade 11s, where you might say, well, where is sine of theta equal to 1 half? 
okay, well, according to the cast rule, sine of theta is equal to one half in this quadrant here. And then also in this quadrant here, let's say it's opposite over hypotenuse, which makes this one 30 degrees opposite hypotenuse. This is kind of, I think, what most of you guys are working on in your assignments the other day. Why are there two answers? Well, one of the reasons why there's two answers is that you can draw a triangle in this quadrant here, and you can draw a triangle in this quadrant here. But I want to use this manipulative to show you another reason why. If this is my graph right here, sine of 1 half is about there. Does that make sense? Like where I'm stopping the duotang is here's 0, here's 1, 1 half is right there. How many times does this intersect the duotang? Once right there, that's 30 degrees. Once right there, that's 120 degrees. You kind of how I see that like this graph kind of represents the exact same thing as the triangles does. If I were to ask you where sine of theta equals negative one half, that would be down here. Sine of theta is negative one half right here and right there, which is why there's two answers. And as this thing keeps repeating, if I were to intersect a line with it, there's going to be at least two answers, but I mean there could even be more answers if you went on the wrong course. So that's what I, that's what my goal is today is to try to show you how these graphs work, how we can do them to solve things. So, um, okay, I think I already kind of covered what I wanted on this slide here. Let's talk about some of the vocabulary I need you guys to know. And since we did physics, you guys should know some things about physics. Do you guys remember what an amplitude is? Yeah. Yeah, basically how tall the wave happens to go. How tall, uh, how tall is these waves? Do you guys know? One, one unit, yeah. Yeah, because it can get as high as 1 or as low as negative 1. So if I were to ask you what the amplitude for either of these graphs is, the answer is 1. Wait, period is how long it takes a graph to repeat itself. How long does it take to repeat itself? Or 2 pi. Depends on whether you're in degrees or radians. If you're in degrees, it takes 360 degrees to repeat. Or if you want to measure it in radians, it takes 2 pi radians to repeat. So like this one here really depends on which units you want to work with. Please come down to the office to check out. What's the domain of this graph? What sort of angles can you use? Can you use negative 7 degrees? Yep. 57 degrees? Yep. A million and 4 degrees? So then for either of these ones here, you can really use any angle you want, positive, negative. However, it's not true for the range. Yeah, you probably write it like something like this. The other way I need you guys to be familiar with, they'll, they're going to put this on your diploma. Do you guys remember this notation? But square brackets, because it can get all the way up to 1. It can reach 1. It just can't go beyond 1. So same thing. Your range is uh, between 1 and negative 1. Okay, now x-intercepts is a bit challenging. How many x-intercepts does this graph have? Well, it only has two that I can see, right? Look at the graph we made right here. There's definitely an x-intercept here and here. But there's also going to be one here, and if this graph keeps going, there'll be another one there. You know what I'm saying here? So this is why we need to introduce the concept of a general solution. Remember that from the other day there? So where, if you've got your sine graph in front of you, where's your first x-intercept? Zero. Where's your next x-intercept? The next one? Okay, so what's it going up by? Okay, so here's how you could write the x-intercepts. Zero plus or minus 180 degrees n times. Does that make sense to everybody how I write that? Okay, it's a little different for cosine, though. This is the first time it's different. Where is your first cosine x-intercept right here? At 90. And then the next one's at 270. And the next one after that would be 180 degrees more than that. So it's very similar, but this x-intercept would be at 90 degrees plus or minus 180n. Whole number, though, yeah. Because it has to be in, like, whole rotations of a... Uh, Um, so, so that's the first time the properties are actually slightly different, is x-intercepts. So they also are different on the y-intercepts. The x-intercept, 
the y-intercept of sine is at 0, but the y-intercept of cosine is up here at 1. So this one is at like 0 and 0, but this one is at uh, 0, 1. That's where the y-intercept is. Um, this last one doesn't actually apply to these graphs, but there are no asymptotes to this, by the way. These don't apply. Properties so that you guys can follow that. Awesome. Okay, moving forward. Okay, um, just like with any other graph, then we can manipulate these graphs using transformation. So I kind of like the way that this is going to dovetail nicely. Our first unit, we talked about how to, with my hands, stretch, stretch, flip, flip, move. You guys remember talking about this a long time ago? This, this is a good unit to actually re revisit that on because we can do all of those transformations to these graphs as well and like manipulate these. You can see how there's three different graphs on here. They're all sine graphs, but some of them have been squished in. For example, the, uh, the red graph is twice as squished as the blue graph. You see how the red graph happened this often? The blue one has actually been like pulled outwards, and then like the green one is actually the longest one. And so we need to talk about how we can manipulate these graphs using transformations. So the first thing is, if you want to figure out the amplitude of the graph, the amplitude is your leading coefficient. If you were to have, like, say, the graph y equals 5 sine theta, what does a 5 in front of the function do? It takes the graph, and I'm using my hands here, it makes it 5 times dollar. Yeah. Vertically expanded, however you want to call it. So you put a 5 or a 7 or something like that in front of the graph, it makes it taller. That affects the amplitude. So if I were to give you the graph of y equals sine theta, the amplitude is 1, because it kind of implies there's a 1 in front of it. If I give you y equals 7 cosine theta, which is just a cosine graph, that is 7 times taller. Does that make sense? Um, you can also change up the period. The period's a little bit more tricky. The way this works is it has to be y equals sine of, say, 2 theta. If you put a 2 inside the graph, it's been a while since we've done this, but a 2 actually takes the whole graph and switches it in. If you guys recall this, it's kind of the opposite of what you'd think. If you have a 2 inside the function, it switches everything in. If you have a 1 half inside the function, it pulls everything out. So I kind of use like the accordion analogy, if that makes sense. If there's a 2, squish the accordion in. If there's a 1 over 5, pull the graph out 5 times. If you guys can kind of see this picture that I've gotten right here, if, uh, if red is the base one, green right here has been squished in. You guys kind of see that there? If red is kind of your base function right here, green has been squished in. Every point here has been shoved in half as much. Whereas blue, blue is being pulled out, blue has been lengthened. So you just have to remember this from our first unit. If B is greater than 1, it's going to squish everything, and that means the period gets shortened. If you pull it out, then the period get le gets lengthened. An easy way to remember this, then, is that the period is 2 pi divided by whatever this number right here happens to be. If it's 2 pi, if the number is 2, normally the period would be 2 pi. If you squish it in, the period is now only pi. Make sense? So whatever number goes in this location right here, Take 2 pi or 360, divide by that number, that's your new period. Okay, so let's just try some really simple examples here. What's the amplitude of each of these graphs? Well, this first graph right here, there's a 1 in front, so the amplitude is 1. This graph right here, there's a 5 in front, the amplitude is 5. There's a 1 half in front, the amplitude is 1 half. Last question. Good. Not negative 3. What's the negative going to do? It's going to flip it upside down, but does that make the graph any taller or lower? Okay. I actually threw a little slide on here. I skipped over it. But I don't know if you guys saw it right here. The amplitude is always the absolute value of the max and the min divided by 2. So even if you have like a negative numbers, it doesn't matter. Like you, you don't have negative amplitude. Okay. Your amplitude is always by default a positive number. So even if you flip the graph upside down, it's going to go down and up and down. I, I don't care. We always make the amplitude positive. Does that make sense? So that's why I threw that last one on here, is that the amplitude is still just 3. 
why don't we do this in degrees for right now just to keep it easy? What's the normal period of a sine graph? Squish it in twice as much. What happens if you put a 2 here and you squish it in twice as much? That's now half as much because you've squished the graph in. Make it one third, and you're actually taking this graph and you're pulling it all the way out three times as much. It's a 1080, yeah. Wait, what if I throw a negative on it? It flips it this way, but it doesn't actually affect your period, though. No. So all you got to do is take 180, no, sorry, 360, and divide by 4. Uh, I don't think it's 90. Because it isn't all the way around the circle into 4 quadrants of 90. So the negatives, just so you guys know, the negatives just flip the graph side by side and upside down. But it doesn't affect how tall they are. It doesn't affect how like long it takes for people. Okay, um, why don't we skip this question here? You could do both the exact same time. You could affect this direction and this direction. Why don't I just do one of these, though? You guys can just watch. If I were to give you uh, this one right here, the amplitude would be 75, and the period would be whatever 360 divided by 12 is, which is 30. Okay. Easy? Okay, so let's just do that one. That's enough. Okay, the other thing you can do to the graph, though, is not only can you squish and, like, pull it bigger, but you can also literally take the entire graph and shift the whole thing up or down or side to side. You guys recall this? This is actually the first thing we learned how to do. If I were just to add two to the graph, all it does is takes the whole graph and lifts everything up, two. Or subtract one, bring it all down, one. Uh, I'm gonna sh Let me show you how this one looks here. If I were to take my graph right here, and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to subtract 2, and I'll make my window go to uh, 360. I'm still going to get my graph. No, I'm not. I know why. My window is actually not big enough here. Let's go from uh, negative 5 to 5. Here's my graph sitting down here. You see how that whole sine graph has been pulled down two units? When I pulled it down to you, and it's actually I pulled it right out of my window, which is why I have Virginia on both sides. So all I've done is I've taken this graph, rather than being up here, where it normally would be, I've just I've moved it two units down. What would happen if I were to, um, I don't have a slide on it. What if I were to do a minus C inside the bracket? Do you remember what that does? Yeah, it moves it either this way or this way. Negatives go this way. Positives go this way. You guys recall? So what we could, in theory, do then is give you a graph with a whole bunch of different transformations. Let's just do one example. Let's say I gave you 5 sine 3 bracket x minus, minus 1 plus 6. Let's say that was our graph. You guys should be able to predict what's going to happen. What's the 3 going to do to the graph? The first three. Oh, sorry, the five. Sorry, the five to the graph. Okay. Five times taller. The three will make it three times this way. The minus one. And then up six. So if I were to graph this, I'm sure I'm going to need to change my window size now. Um, let's make it go from negative 10 to 10. So we have a graph that it looks like it's been squished in. If it was 360 degrees, normally, it would have gone through one rotation. But since there was a three there, can you guys see how it went through three rotations? Because of the fact it got squished in. It's definitely taller. Its amplitude must now be five. And then it looks like it's been shifted over, and it's definitely been shifted up. So long story short, I need you guys to be able to handle transformations on this unit as well. You guys feel like you can handle that? Yeah. OK, let's try some diploma questions. Because that's, I think, what I have for many of the next ones here. You guys find this? We'll skip ahead. So these came off all diplomas. Here's the first one. I want you to figure out using this little snippet of graph right here, which is the right equation for it. So A is 42 cosine theta minus pi over 2 plus 28. 42 minus pi plus 70. You guys see all the four answers, right? Let's talk through what's happening. Here we have a graph that's going up and down like this. How am I going to figure out the amplitude? 
figure out the amplitude, take the highest point you have on the graph, which would have been 112, take the lowest point you have, which is 28, subtract them and divide by 2. Close. So 112 minus 28. So actually, I need to do 112 plus 28. Divide by 2. And then I'm also going to do 112 minus 28. Divide by 2. One of them was 70. One of them was 42. If you were to add the two numbers and divide by 2, if you were to add the two numbers and divide by 2, what's going to end up happening is it's going to tell you where the middle of the graph is. And when I did that right here, add them together, divide by 2, I got 70, which means that the middle of my graph is at 70. So if you add them and divide by 2, it gives you the middle of the graph. If you were to subtract them and divide by 2, which is when I got 42, that then tells you that the graph goes up by 42 and down by 42, and then up by 42. Does that make sense? Okay, so did amplitude help us, though? Uh, no, they were all 42. So. But you know what? I by, by adding them and dividing by 2, I actually can narrow one down. It's not 8. Why? Because all of them have to be up 70, because this graph has been lifted up 70 units. Right? Hopefully you can kind of see that. The middle of my graph goes right to the 70. So it's got to be one of these three. So then the last question is, is it been shifted over pi units, pi over 2 units, or 3 pi over 2 units? Your cosine graph is supposed to start at the very, very peak right here on the intercept. But the highest point we have right here is right there. It should have been over here. But can you guys see how it's been shifted over? How far was it shifted over? Pi over 2. So the answer was C. It should have started right here, but we slid it over pi over 2 units for the cosine graph. So. Oh, another diploma question here. Um, this is a really common type of question. I've been prepping you guys for it for like the last year and a half I've been teaching. It's the leading coefficient problem. We're going to give you an equation. You're going to be lacking a leading coefficient. And to find that leading coefficient, all you need is a random point on the graph. You guys see how that's what we have here? I give you y equals a cosine theta minus pi over 4 minus 4. I give you a point on the graph, and, and I ask you for a. Now, they could change the question up and say, what's the amplitude of the graph? But like the amplitude of the graph is going to be whatever a is. So all we've got to do here is take negative 2, make it your y value. I need to take pi over 2, make it my x value, and solve. Which is a little more challenging because you're not as comfortable, probably, working with cosines of pi over 2 and stuff like that. But we should still be able to do this. Um, OK, if I want to get a by itself, one of the things I'm going to have to do is add 4 to both sides. You guys follow that bit? Okay, inside the brackets, I have pi over 2 minus pi over 4. What is half of pi minus a quarter of pi? A quarter of pi. If you have half of something, and you lose a quarter, like say you have 50 cents, and you lose 25 cents, you're left with 25 cents. So in a way, this right here is pi over 4. Now, you could just go right to your calculator and just type in cosine pi over 4. May as well try it, right? Cosine pi over 4, see what that's equivalent to. Make sure, though, that you're in radians. If you're in degrees, it's no good, right? Here's the problem. I'm going to get an irrational number. Now, that's not going to be a big issue on this question here because they're going to ask you to round it. But I think we should practice our exact values here. So you guys remember pi over 4 as a triangle? Do you know what it is as degrees, pi over 4? What's pi over 2? It's half of a circle, right? If pi is 180 degrees, pi over 2 is 90, so pi over 4 is 45. So I'm really asking you what a 45 degree triangle involves. And it's 1, 1, root 2. Okay, cosine is supposed to be adjacent over hypotenuse. So adjacent over hypotenuse gives me this. So what I'm going to suggest to do is write it as this. I'm going to replace all of cosine pi over 4 with 1 over root 2. 
which is 0 0.70, whatever you want to call it. How do you get it by itself? Though? I think I had times by root 2. Does that make sense? Like, I get what you're saying. You could divide by 1 over root 2, but why don't you just times the root 2 up to their side? So make it 2 root 2 equals A. Now, this question here, though, asked it to be rounded to the nearest tenth. So all you've got to do is 2 root 2, and you'll get your answer as 2.8. However, I've, hopefully I've shown you some questions like this before. They could ask you to round it to blank root blank is the A value, and they might ask you to make it numeric response, in which case, in which case you have to know how to do exact values. You get what I'm saying here? If you don't know how to replace a cosine of pi over 4 with the fraction 1 over root 2, and you just try to do it with a decimal number, you could have then said the decimal number was 0 0.707. You could have taken 2 and divided by 0 0.707106, and it'll get you that same number there. But if they want it to be written in this sort of format here, you'd, you'd be out of luck. Does that make sense on that one? Try another one here. What they often like to do, did I go too fast? You're good? Okay. Okay. What they often like to do is give you incomplete graphs. And so they've given here a graph of a cosine, but they actually haven't given every single value. They've given the plus pi over 2, they've given the negative 3, but they're throwing in a k and a minus b, just to be jokes. One of the things you can do, I think you guys did this a lot in the exponents unit, just make up numbers for k and b. It does work. Um, what I'm really hoping for here, though, is a little bit more logical reasoning as to, like, what does a cosine graph normally look like? Well, a cosine graph normally looks like this. Does that make sense? <coughs> now, when you add a negative 3 to it, what does that do to the graph? flips it and makes it three times bigger. So really what's going to happen is your y-intercept is now going to be way the heck down here. Does that make sense? Worse, what is minus b going to do to the graph? It's going to move this whole graph down an unknown number of units. So this graph is now going to be upside down. It's going to be even further down because it's going to go down even more. You know what we haven't accounted for? We haven't accounted for this and this right here. Because what is that k value going to do to a graph? This way, though. Hang on. If the y-intercept is that going to affect it, what happens when you do that plus pi over 2? It's going to move it over. But what's going to end up happening then is the graph used to look like, say, this, like that. And as soon as you pick that whole graph up and you slide it over, it's going to kind of move where the intercept is. So I want to show you another little trick on how to solve this one here. What makes something a y-intercept? A y-intercept occurs when x is, yeah, that's actually the key to solving this one here. Although you can try to figure it out in other ways, a y-intercept means that x is 0. Only we're not using x here, we're using theta. So all I need for you guys to do is go f of 0 is negative 3 cosine of k times 0 plus pi over 2 minus b. All I'm doing is I'm replacing this right here with 0. What's k times 0 going to be? Oh, it's useless. Okay, so what we're left with negative 3 cosine of pi over 2. Uh, minus b. What's cosine of pi over 2 going to be? Pi over 2 is 90 degrees. You okay with that? What's cosine of 90? You can use this thing right here. Here's cosine. Cosine of 90 is 0. You can even just look at your little manipulator here. So really, if cosine of 90 is 0, then negative 3 times 0 is 0. So that's all a wash. So what's your y-intercept? 
Negative B. Which is A. Isn't that clever? I think a question like this is designed to be a time suck because it's actually super easy if you remember that a y intercept means x is zero. Otherwise, you spend forever making up values for b and x and k and stuff like that, and it takes a long time. Like, you'd probably still get there, but that's kind of a clever question. Oh, wait, I'm running out of time here. I just got to figure out what else I want to do. Oh, okay. I am almost done, right? I just have pictures of graphs. Okay. Um, curriculum says says you're supposed to know what sine graphs look like, cosine graphs look like, and tan graphs look like. However, I want to cover my basis. I'm going to show you all six. Okay? So I'm going to show you, so I've already shown you sine and cosine. I want to show you what tan looks like in the next two minutes here. And then I also want to show you what secant, cosecant, and cotan look like. I'm not expecting you to get assessed on the remaining three, but I just want to do this. Does that make sense? So that's what we're doing here. What I want to show you right now is how to graph tan. And See if this proof makes sense to you. Sine of theta was y over r. Remember that from before? And cosine of theta was x over r, which was opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse. This was opposite over adjacent. Tan of theta is your y value divided by your x value. It's actually possible for us to figure out tan based on sine and cosine. Watch this. Tan is actually equal to sine divided by cosine. Sine was supposed to be y over r. Cosine was supposed to be x over r. See how both this one and this one both involve something being over r? Well, what ends up happening then is this over r can cancel with this over r, and tan is equal to y over x. But like another way of thinking about it is really what tan is equal to, it's equal to a sine graph divided by a cosine graph. So I'd like to, on the next slide right here, show you what tan looks like. This is a tangent graph. Very strange. So I want to explain why this occurs the way it does. Okay. Use your manipulative again. What we're gonna do? <laughs> we're gonna do an airplane. <laughs> well, I did say you might not need it. I did say that. Okay. What we're gonna do is try to visualize what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen when you take in my graph, in my example right here? What happens when you take the purple graph and divide it by the pink graph? So I'm gonna start right here. The purple graph's value is 0. The pink graph's value is 1. 0 divided by 1 is 0, which is why um, right here it says 0. Now I want to focus on another value here. Let's start on this little ridge right here. Again, we're going purple divided by pink. It's going to be 1 divided by, can you do 1 divided by 0? No. Error code, hence. There's an asymptote right there. Because you physically can't do that. Four minutes. Okay, I'm going to talk anyways. Um, again, we're doing purple divided by pink. Here it's zero. Divide by negative 1. 0 divided by negative 1 is 0, which is why at our next point here, it's back at being 0. No. Then over here, it's purple divided by pink, so it's negative 1 divided by 0. You can't do that, which is why, if you're wondering why the heck we had asymptotes there, tan graphs can have asymptotes. Okay. What really ends up happening is it goes alternate. It alternates 0, asymptote, 0, asymptote, 0, asymptote. And then really the rest of the graph is almost kind of like what I showed you guys today in, um, in chemistry. Remember that um, titration curve kind of shape to it? Turn your head sideways. What you've got here is the titration curve that kind of goes like this, only you've got to go like, my neck's starting to hurt. Did you guys kind of see that? What was that? From like chemistry this morning? Titration. Like remember the graph I showed you this morning in chemistry that looked something like this, like that. Okay. Do you remember this? It, it, I didn't plan on this, but like this inflection point right here, the uh, end point that we have in chemistry, it's almost the exact same thing as this tan graph right here, only it's turned sideways. Okay. And so it goes like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. So it always alternates asymptote y-intercept, well, asymptote y-intercept. Okay. So you guys are supposed to know what these, what this graph looks like. I know I'm running out of time. 
Amplitude does not apply. There is no amplitude. However, the period of this graph is either 180 degrees or pi. The reason why is that unlike sine and cosine, which has to go positive quadrant, negative quadrant, positive quadrant, negative quadrant, this one basically goes whoosh, asymptote, whoosh, asymptote, whoosh, asymptote. And so it doesn't happen, it doesn't have to happen every 360 degrees. It actually happens every 180 degrees. And I can also show you that another reason why. You guys remember doing cast rules for tan, C-A-S-T? Tan and everybody's side are always separated by 180 degrees when you're talking about tan. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, basically this is the graph here. Um, what ends up happening is you have tons of x-intercepts, but you basically you have an asymptote alternating. So it always goes x-intercept, asymptote, x-intercept, asymptote. Um, I know I'm really speeding through these last things here. Here are pictures of secant, cosecant, and cotan. Why don't we talk about those another day, though? So, and then I've got some other practice diploma questions. So, does that work? I hope that now helps you guys answer those other questions we didn't do on, our, on your assignment. So, next time I do a lesson, I'll just loop back to this again. That works. Right, thanks, guys. Sorry, I went really long today. <laughs>